Good afternoon. My name is Michael Patrick McCart, Sr. I'm a partner at Adams and Reese in the Labor and Employment Law Department. And for over 30 years, I've been practicing traditional labor law throughout the 50 United States and uh, Canada. And this year, we have an interesting presentation on the wholesale changes that have occurred to the National Labor Relations Act. And because of the National Labor Relations Board during the last 12 months, we certainly aren't here to be alarmist, but to help you analyze and dissect the changes so that they can figure out the impact that they have on your business and how you should react accordingly. It's important to know that uh, unlike many prior years with the National Labor Relations Act, this year's, this year's changes have several things in common. They often will have deep felt impacts in both union and non-union companies. And you have to be aware of which hat you're wearing when you deal with these changes. And you also have to see how the board has cleverly put things together that interrelate in a way that laymen may miss on an initial pass through, but they're important to see that many of these things are designed to overlap and create traps for employers. Um, I, I would like to point out, and certainly we're not here to politicize the process, but it would be unfair and unrealistic to fail to recognize that the National Labor Relations Board is, in fact, a partisan political agency. It's, it's supposed to have five members, and they are quite intentionally divvied up based on the presidential party in power. In other words, the president's party is permitted to appoint three members to the National Labor Relations Board, and the party not in power gets up to two. Uh, however, recently in American politics, the trend has been for the party in power to disregard the minority party. Uh, Barack Obama, for instance, notoriously appointed three Democrats and no Republicans. Uh, and Joe Biden at this time has three Democrats and, and just a single Republican. Uh, so remember that these are, there are political decisions that take part in this and a political agenda that takes part in this. So we try not to let politics interject itself, but just be aware that there is a, a, a pall that is that the po politicians cast over this agency and it cannot be helped but to be recognized. I'd like to start today with the change that was made in August, and it was actually two changes made in, in, at the same time. Uh, the National Labor Relations Board promulgated new election rules, and they did this in a two-step process. The first step was through rulemaking, which they had undertaken during the Obama administration to shorten the time that an election was held from when uh, a union demanded it and to facilitate the faster flow of, in, of information from the employer to the union. And then in addition to that, they, they, have, they decided a seminal case called CMEX Cement that changed the election process as we've known it uh, for all of our lives entirely. And it will take all of us some getting used to. So I'll, I'll start with the, the part that some of us may be familiar with. You, you saw the election procedures and, and in the early two, 2010s. And what, what that has done is, for those of you that have been through this process in the traditional manner, a typical election lasted about 42 days from when a union asked for it until the ballots were, were presented to the voters and counted to make a determination. That process under the rulemaking that will take effect on December 26th 
will be shortened to 14 to 17 days, depending on the situation. What they've done is put the burden on the employer to, to turn over information regarding everybody who would be an eligible voter. That information would include their name, their department, their home address, their email address, a home telephone number, and a cell phone number. That does seem burden, burdensome. It's intentional. Uh, an employer can get in trouble if it does not maintain this information and supply it to the union within the first 48 hours of an election petition. This is designed to help the unions contact the voters and, of course, in this shortened election period, quickly get them interested in the union's message and to the polls. Um, the second thing the rulemaking is designed to do is to have a union decide who is eligible and who is not eligible to vote. Uh, I'll use a tired but traditional example of a production maintenance unit in a, in a factory or a warehouse. And everybody that is involved in that process was typically eligible to vote. The, the new process is designed, they're known as micro units, and they're designed to let the union pick and choose so they want to vote. They just want the janitors to vote they're gonna allow a janitorial unit to have an election. They just want one department to vote, quality control department to vote. The National Labor Relations Board is gonna favor whatever grouping of employees and a union sees fit. It is 100% incumbent upon employer to challenge the appropriateness of who gets to vote and the burden of demonstrating that somebody must be allowed to vote or must not be permitted to vote is going to be almost insurmountable once the union states a preference for whom it thinks is in the appropriate bargaining unit. Um, as I mentioned, this personal information is transmitted to the union in a shorter time. This is something that has historically caused some employees uh, tremendous discomfort. They don't like their personal information being transmitted to a third party. And they're particularly uncomfortable now that the National Labor Relations Board is demanding additional information, such as home phone numbers, addresses, and cell phone numbers, and email addresses. It's important to remember that during union organizing, unions can and will visit employees at, at their homes during the election period, whereas an employer is never permitted the latitude to visit an employee at their home. So the unions try to get this information as quickly as possible so they can get the employees accustomed to the idea that home visits are going to be part of the process of persuading them to vote for the union. Now, I say vote somewhat optimistically because as I mentioned on August 25th, the CMEX decision came down and the board has now made it perfectly clear that they prefer that elections actually no longer be part of the National Labor Relations Board process. I know this may sound crazy, but what they're trying to do is to get a situation where if the employees decide they want the union, that that viewpoint is forced on everybody without the chance for it information from both sides to be transmitted and just impose unionization on all employees. In short, the National Labor Relations Board now sees its role solely as facilitating the relationship between employees who may have wanted to explore getting further information regarding unionization and simply imposing that union on the employer for all time. 
let's take a look at how that would work. The I mentioned that there have been curbs placed on when an election will be held. The process is now even further modified in that unions will no longer be called upon to take their petition to the labor board and ask for an election. Rather, it will be incumbent upon employers who are faced with a challenge from a labor organization to go to the labor board and announce this challenge coming from the union and ask the labor board to conduct an election. How this process would work is at some juncture, the union has to inform the employer that it represents a majority of the employees. I'll have more on the details of this in a moment, but it's important to understand at this point that there is no formality required to this process. Rather, the union simply has to stop a supervisor. It could be in the parking lot at work before or after work or during the shift. It could be the president of the company. It could be anybody with authority to speak on behalf of the company. And through a union representative or an employee organizer, it informs the employer that it it represents a majority of the people it believes form a bargaining unit and that it wants to proceed in representing those employees. Historically, an employer could have shrugged its shoulders and told the union to do as it will and carry on. Now, under the CMEX decision decided in August 2023, an employer is required to gather that information and go to the labor board and say, there is a union claiming to represent a majority of our employees, and we're asking you to conduct an election to validate or invalidate that claim. We've been given guidance from the labor board subsequent to that decision because it was somewhat ephemeral when it was simply written. And we now know that from the time we are told that a union represents a majority of the employees, we have 14 days to ask for an election. If the employer does not make that request of the National Labor Relations Board in 14 days, the law is that they will seek a bargaining order requiring the employer to recognize and bargain with the union without any type of election ever being conducted. This should horrify all of us as un-American and undemocratic, and it is all of those things, but for now, it is the law of the land. Secondly, the, the more convoluted portion of this is the union proclaims that it represents a majority of the employees. And after that moment at which they announce they represent a majority, the employer somehow commits an unfair labor practice between the time of the request or demand and the election taking place. The board's position is that there's automatically a union in place the employer has interfered in the process, and the employer must recognize the union without an election being conducted. It's, uh, it is a scary system that is designed to allow unions to fast track themselves into place. Throughout the history of the National Labor Relations Act, which was passed in 1935, Unions oscillated between winning between 45 and 55 percent of elections. At the beginning of this year, just before these processes were announced, that number had moved to an astonishing and eye-popping 90 percent of union elections. 
Unions were winning virtually every election they saw. And now as we can see together, these rules and processes are designed that unions will win virtually every time they make a claim to represent an employee. There is going to be very little employers are able to do without facing unfair labor practice charges and lengthy, complicated litigation. Lastly, as I mentioned with the bargaining rules, it's true in CMEX, employers are going to be very limited in arguing about the scope of the bargaining unit, which employees are allowed to vote, which employees are not allowed to vote. The union's desire, I would say, is going to mandate 95% of that process. An employer is not going to be able to present evidence at any point in this process in order to demonstrate that certain employees should or should not vote. I want to talk about the overlap, if I may, for a moment. Um, as, I, as I've demonstrated, we're going to see that they're making it much, much easier for employers to inadvertently commit unfair labor practices. And that's going to be one of the tricks that they use to say, oh, a majority claim was made, and now you've tripped over one of our new trap unfair labor practices, you have a union. Employers are going to have to familiarize themselves with these rules and decide where and when it is they can take chances because once the union starts claiming majority, it is going to be nigh on impossible to fight that union. I would like to point out that the National Labor Relations Board has stated quite clearly that it expects the old laws that had been in effect previously will continue to be in effect today. What do I mean by that? Well, historically, if, a, if an employer was presented with a petition or with cards and it agreed to look at those cards, they would be bound by the results. So if you had 100 employees in the unit and you looked at a petition or looked at cards and 51 of them had been signed, you were no longer permitted to require an election. The board is going to allow employers to be ambushed like this presently. It's the sneakiest part of the new law and it's what you have to warn your supervisors about. Under no circumstances should we ever double check their veracity and ask them to show the cards or ask to see those petitions. That could be a fatal mistake in union organizing and we don't wanna hamstring ourselves even more than the federal agency is already electing to do. We've gotta go slow we've got to be measured. It's our right to contest their findings without looking at them. And the only way we can do that is to go to the labor board and demand an election be held in the face of a claim. That's the only way we're gonna be able to find out whether or not that claim has veracity or whether or not they're, they're just trying to sandbag their way into our facility. Uh, as long as we know that we shouldn't look at petitions or take them at their word, we can hopefully rely on even the new limited election process to work in our favor and give us the time to com communicate our message to the employees so that we're not faced with our own actions taking away free choice from our employees. 
So I'm sure later in the process, we will have questions on that. I did mention during the introduction that there will be an opportunity uh, at the end of this to, to ask questions and I'll do my best to answer every single one timely and correctly. Also, for those of us who are here to get a CLE or SHRM credit, um, there will be a process at the end of this where you have to acknowledge that I've not yet put you to sleep and that you, you're still watching and there's a poll question and then we take the poll question and get to move on. Uh, this next major change has to do with our already unionized employers and uh and it imply it, it applies in in two different areas it applies if you've just become unionized for the first time and you're negotiating for that first contract or for those employers with a rich history of contracts and they're simply negotiating uh, another successor collective bargaining agreement uh, there's major changes here. Historically, employers were permitted to bargain to impasse, to get to that point with the union where the parties could bargain no further and they weren't going to come to an agreement. And the employer was permitted to make changes uh, to the work rules and benefits uh, of the employees consistent with of the management rights clause in the contract and its practice of dealing with employees in the past. Uh, so the past practice now is no longer a reason for us to be able to implement our offers and impasse. And any decision that allows the employer the discretion, for instance, if we wanted to give merit wage increases, so you could give employees one, three, five, seven, nine percent, you would not be permitted, absent the agreement of the union, to implement the amount of negotiated wages, even if we believe that the employees consistent with our practice were due for a raise, and even if we could show that we had exercised that discretion within a certain window, we would not be permitted to give them raises. This is designed to shift the advantage in bargaining to the union, which does not have to, of course, agree with our presentation and our proposals any more than we do. But they're trying to shift that. The scales are not 50-50 anymore. The board is trying to put its thumb on the scale and give an advantage to the union, which is bargaining, which is asking. They can only get what we agree to give them, of course, and to to give them an advantage in that we're not able to impose our will through the bargaining process on them. Um, I think for those of you who are thinking about the implications of this, what should scare all of us as managers if we find ourselves in this situation is the obvious change that we don't drive and that's health insurance premiums. Employers are always faced with passing on some portion or a big portion of an increase in insurance premiums, which we usually don't have any ability to influence how much those changes are going to be. Uh, we will no longer be able to bargain to impasse with the union and pass those changes along. And I do foresee some scary scenarios where unions will be recalcitrant in the bargaining process and not allow us to get to a contract solely to prevent large premium increases being passed on to the employees. It will be interesting to see how much litigation results from that and just exactly how that litigation ends up playing out. 
it's going to be a challenge, a delicate balance for employers to figure out how to work through the insurance problem as this law solidifies and, and goes forward, assuming there isn't a change in the board um, in approximately one year. Um, so the, 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 these are the areas where it works. The other major area where we're experiencing a wholesale shift is the dues checkoff. We, for forever, the dues checkoff expired with the collective bargaining agreement. And then about 10 years ago, there was a period of three or four years where the board required an employer to recognize union even the checkoff, I'm sorry, after the expiration of the contract. They weren't allowed to negotiate their way out of it. The board is returning to that limited doctrine and saying that we as the employer are now responsible for collecting union dues for the union and forwarding them to the union. Whether or not the union bargains in good faith for a successor contract or whether or not the, there's negotiated provisions to let check off sunset, the board is expressing a policy preference that check off never be allowed to expire. So that will make negotiating contracts tactically more difficult. Moving ahead now, um, this is one of those areas that will apply equally to non-union and union employers. This is the National Labor Relations Board making itself more present in our lives. And, and through the doctrine of protected concerted activity, uh, making itself present with non-union as well as union employees. We see this as, as professionals and dealing with our employees most frequently when employees are attempting to be workplace lawyers or employee advocates or candidly just troublemakers. The, the labor board and, and the courts have wrestled with this issue and gone back and forth on when an employee engages in protected concerted activity. Unfortunately, the courts have leaned towards really permitting intransigent, appropriate, uh, appropriate, appropriate conduct by employees, swearing, name calling, vile, vile things that we would think it is incumbent upon ourselves as employers to protect our employees from through our harassment policies, through our sexual harassment policies, through our racial harassment policies, that more and more the board and the courts are seeking to excuse as heat of the moment or the type of conduct that is routinely seen in the workplace. It's very alarming that they don't often take into account to any degree exactly how egregious the employee's behavior is, but rather you're drawing a moral equivalence between a, a, a workplace that occasionally allows swearing and somebody who goes off on a, a obscene tirade and outburst against senior management and the conduct is simply being excused as uh, something that's to be expected under the circumstances because when you're advocating for your livelihood there's more at stake than meets the eye. Uh, the board likes this totality of the circumstances. They look at where the conduct took place, what was said, how do employees behave routinely when dealing with one another in that workplace, is horseplay tolerated? 
Um, and also the board frightening here is extending the conduct to not conduct where just two employees rise up to make their workplace better or protect another employee, but rather any kind of action that can be deduced as inducing improvement for all employees. Say one employee screams, it's about time insurance rates come down. Even if there's no indication any longer that that employee uh, was ratified by his coworkers to make that conduct or, or she, she just was fed up because her own family's insurance was so high, the board is now going to protect that conduct and, and take this totality of the circumstances approach and infer that it was designed to be linked to or at least to induce group action. I, I have to say, as lawyers and human resources professionals, we should all be alarmed. It, it is difficult when the fact finder assumes certain things are going to happen, such as this is definitely decided to benefit the group and everybody's going to agree, it is going to be almost impossible for us to get to that point where we can disprove that anybody wanted to do these things and was really acting solely as a lone gunman, if you will, and trying to only feather their own nest. Uh, this is an area of the law where the board has gone back and forth and back and forth and given us fits as managers uh, being unable to tamp down what exactly is being required and what exactly we're supposed to do when faced with this conduct. Because typically these cases arise when somebody is being very bold and obnoxious, and it can be very difficult going forward to lawfully discipline these employees. Also of some concern is under this totality of the circumstances, they are allowing employees to engage in conduct with non-employees, such as interns or contractors, and inducing action on their behalf. They're saying that anything that you would say to an intern or a contractor necessarily translates to mutual and aid protection for the regular employees and is seen as providing benefit and cover to those employees and affecting and improving their terms and conditions of employment. This one is difficult for us as managers because it is really, it, it is not very logical. It doesn't have a basis in common sense. And I believe it is going to be difficult to defend these cases until the board presents us with possibilities where we can present a defense to not tolerating this type of conduct. The next area, again, that applies to, to both union and non-union employees and will have a profound impact on, on my opening topic, which is the election demand and the unfair labor practice is um, I wrote a client alert for some of you may have seen a couple months ago about the board's change on employers implementing work rules and handbook policies. And there's a question of whether or not a, a work rule or handbook policy unlawfully tends to chill employees from exercising rights they simply believe they have under the act. Uh, that's a, 
almost unrecognizable standard for an employer. If, if you have an employee that wants to argue they believed they had the right to do something, it is going to be difficult to dissuade a court from thinking that they believe they had that right. It is not any longer even an objective test. Would a reasonable employee think their rights are being interfered with? But rather, whether or not the employer, the employee, I'm sorry, can give the rule an application that the employer was going to use it in an unlawful manner. Um, so, you know, for instance, the, the main areas that the Labor Board likes to interfere with employee rules is civility uh, or, or respectful conduct um, insubordination. The Labor Board has always hated employers that wrote its employees up for insubordination. I myself worked at the Labor Board for several years in the 1990s, and I was always astonished that the Labor Board was entirely intolerant of an employer defense that was centered around insubordinate conduct. They felt it was too amorphous to be enforced. And they honestly believed within the agency that it was a code word designed to protect unlawful conduct when they couldn't think of anything else to say. So in defending work rules and handbook policies now, the burden is entirely on the employer promulgating the rule to prove two things. One, that the rule is part of a legitimate and substantial business interest. And then the really difficult part of this is two, that there's no more narrow way to effectuate that rule. So we have to prove our business interest in the rule, maintaining production order and discipline, and that there wasn't a more narrow way to do that. And if we don't prove both of those things, we will be found guilty of an unfair labor practice. As I said at the onset of this presentation, these rules are cut to overlap seamlessly. And you can see now how the Labor Board is going to use work rules, seemingly neutral work rules that merely exist in our handbook and say that we promulgated those rules to chill employees' organizing rights. They have a majority, and therefore we have to recognize the union. It's a very troubling trend on the horizon, and it's going to be very difficult, even for the most sophisticated and savvy employers who work tirelessly to get these rules exactly right in order to make them meet this very, very steep burden that there was no more narrow way to do it and that it was tied directly to our substantial business interest. Um, these laws will be found to be unlawful even where there has not been any evidence that it was un applied or could have been applied in an unlawful manner. It's simply incumbent upon the employer to, to demonstrate that the rule was tied to that business interest. The new test removes, as I mentioned, objectivity, and it supplants objectivity with, with economic dependency. Well, 
that test seems like a slippery slope to me. I don't like to be alarmist. I don't think you come here to see me be alarmist. But technically, Jeff Bezos is economically dependent on Amazon. Of course, an employee is economically dependent on the employer. That's almost the very definition of the relationship. So it is difficult for me to find a test where an employer can show that there is no economic dependency uh, for even its highest ranking employees, who obviously won't be the ones challenging our work rules. Rather, those are the employees that will be tasked with helping us define the substantial business interest and the least obstructive alternative. Um, if an employee can take a rule and interpret it to meaning if they violate it, they're in fear that they'll be disciplined or discharged, we can bet that there are going to be challenges, that it's an unfair labor practice, that we have that rule on the book. And the, the Labor Board is looking, as I mentioned, to civility rules, to access to our, our building rules. They, they don't like it when we try to keep a first shift employee from disrupting the workforce on second and third shift. And the other hot button topic for the labor industry these days is recording. Uh, the labor board, many states, Florida, California, Illinois, don't permit tape recording of, of, of conversation unless two employees consent to it. But the labor board loves, loves surreptitious recording and and loves to reward the surreptitious recording. And so we're going to have a difficult time when we update our handbooks going forward. We're going to have to be extra, extra careful when we are carving in new work rules in the way and manner in which we put those rules into our handbooks. We will have to ask ourselves as managers, what is a legitimate employer interest and is there a way we can protect it without going as far as we just did? The only guarantee I can give to every one of us coming out of this is there is going to be scores of litigation on employer work rules and they are going to be decided one at a time for the foreseeable future. Now, we've come to that section where I have to ask each of you, are you still watching? So take a few seconds, wake up, try not to be too bored with what's going on, answer the question for the overlords of CLE, and we'll move forward shortly. Excellent. The joint employer area is one of the most fascinating areas that the Labor Board is seeking to make changes. And it is for those of us who have other relationships in employment, be that as contractors or subcontractors or working in another business, the the Labor Board has proposed a rule that will take effect, uh, is supposed to take effect on December 26th of this year. And I can tell you that virtually every co-employment situation henceforth will be a joint. They're going after McDonald's in this situation. Um, They're trying to find McDonald's and its franchises all to be joint employers. They want to be able to go after the deepest pocket McDonald's in all situations. And unfortunately, they're splashing that all over all of these situations. I represent tons of security companies throughout the United States. And they, of course, all provide security, you know, armed and unarmed for for clients. Well, the clients and the security company are going to be deemed joint. It is the right to control that will determine whether or not there's a joint employer. The right to control can be entirely dormant and you are still a joint employer within the meaning 
of the new joint employer rule of the National Labor Relations Board, the right to control can be completely and utterly unexercised and unutilized. But if it exists in the contracts, it will be a joint employment relationship. Any control over wages and benefits, hours of work and scheduling, Think about my security situation. The client is going to tell us when employees have to be scheduled, uh, the types of duties to be performed. And of course, the one control that clients like where they have third party employees, they like to be able to have that employee removed. All of these situations will be joint employers going forward. Means that if there's a union relationship, both parties will be required to be at the table. It means if there's a cost involved and an expense involved, both parties will have to bear the expense. Uh, it is going to be very complicated and create a lot of stress on the business end between two partner businesses that have employees that overlap. And be a very difficult situation to control just on the business side, let alone in dealing with the outside third party who is trying to ingratiate themselves into a process where they probably don't belong in the first place. Uh, this will be a difficult situation and bears watching the developments. Um, we're down to now something else I wrote about earlier this year, and that is um, employee discipline. Uh, it, this is very similar to with the protected concerted activity. Um, we're, we're taking every type of conduct on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, we're we're, we're going to protect abusive conduct where we can. And even when they're acting out of control, if it's triggered by a strike or a heated union negotiation, the pendulum is swinging in favor of the employee who is going to be protected when engaging in conduct that really is not appropriate for the workplace. The board will allow discipline only after viewing where the activity took place what was the subject matter of the activity, the nature of the outburst, and whether or not the outburst was provoked by the ULP. Notice nowhere in there is the labor board actually determining the substance of the conduct. So if a frustrated employee yells racial epithets in response to difficult union situation, it is very likely they're going to get away with it. And then we have to ask ourselves, how do we properly maintain our sexual harassment policies? How do we maintain our racial harassment policies? And the balancing act becomes very difficult overzealous employees who are abusive are going to receive more protection under these principles than they have in the past. And we just have to be mindful that this is a, something that has gone back and forth and back and forth and may switch again if there's a switch back to a Republican control board. Uh, severance agreements is something that everybody on this call is has to be aware of. They have to be thinking about what they put in them. The labor board has decided to interject itself into all non-union situations here because they have restricted or eliminated the employer's ability to put non-disparagement con conduct in a severance agreement and they've restricted confidentiality provisions. It is very important for us to note as human resources professionals, this is an independent unfair labor practice. This would also apply to non-employees. What does that mean? 
if you have a supervisor or a manager that's signing one of these severance agreements and we put a confidentiality provision in there that is deemed unnecessary, it is an unfair, independent, unfair labor practice. They will take us to the National Labor Relations Board to have that agreement invalidated. This is an area, again, where you can see would have no bearing whatsoever on union organizing, but if you had layoffs coupled with union organizing, the severance agreements could inadvertently provide the key to the unfair labor practice that made us recognize the union. This particular change in the National Labor Relations Act is a very bitter pill for employers to swallow. They've held tight to these non-disparagement and confidentiality provisions forever. And for the time being, we have to think more about protecting our interests through standard uh, defamation law in our respective states or cities, and perhaps just letting confidentiality go for the time being. It is going to be difficult to justify a confidentiality provision for the National Labor Relations Board uh, to the current composition of this board with the three Democrats and the lone Republican. Um, there are other things to watch for. I know I myself don't like the Karnak the Great type presentations where we predict the future. So I would just stick to the couple of things that that the Labor Board has stated that they want to make changes to in the future. And that is they want to ban mandatory meetings. We talked about union organizing campaigns. Mandatory meetings are the lifeblood of how an employer communicates its message to prevent unionization. The union want the the NLRB wants to take that tool out of our bucket and not allow us to tell employees what to do on working time. They want to exclude exclude expand the access of our email systems to unions and outside organizers for the purpose of spreading unionization. I will only add to this that it's critical now that employers start making sure that, that they own the email systems and inform employees that they have the right to review them and make sure they're being used for all lawful purposes. Uh, a very controversial stance of the National Labor Relations Board right now is they're seeking to prohibit non-competes. California prohibits them. I believe Massachusetts prohibits them. They are getting more controversial in the workplace and stricter and stricter going forward. The Labor Board would like to eliminate them in their entirety. And of course, if the National Labor Relations Board prohibits them, unlike any other agency, they will in fact be prohibited. They want to expand the stranger right to access our property. As it stands now, if a non-employee organizer comes on our property, we have unlimited right to exclude that person from anywhere that we own. The National Labor Relations Act would seek to give these people the right to come into some of our non-work areas and talk to our employees as they see fit. And finally, something I hope none of us has ever faced with, but in the horrific event that we're faced with a labor stoppage or strike, the, currently we are prohibit, per, permitted to hire permanent replaces during a strike the the current general counsel of the labor board is is going to ask at some point that even though the supreme court has found this to be lawful she wants the national labor relations board to overrule the supreme court and say that this economic right of an employer has gone too far uh, it's quite a bit of information for one day i hope everybody 
has something that struck a chord with them and they want to talk about with their friends and colleagues or think about. Um, however, right now, if there's something I, I failed to make clear or piqued your interest, this is the time for us to raise questions and I'll do my best to answer them all. Uh, thank you very much for listening to me today and uh, have a great holiday season. Uh, we'll hope to see you all down the line. Thanks.